friends who are comrades in solving the world's problems, in cooperating to solve the world's problems. In Buddhism, we have the word Saha Dhammika, which means to unite in one's common duty, to unite in a common duty. This can mean to the duty within the religion itself, or it can, it can mean duties outside the religion or between or amongst other religions. Therefore, today, we will speak as friends who are united in performing this a certain basic duty. We can call each other Sahadamika friends. That we use this time of the day, the early morning, to develop understanding is something that has reasons behind it. If you want, you can even say that it's a holy time. This early morning is the time when most flowers bloom and open. It's also the time when our teacups have not yet overflowed. It's a very appropriate time for working to, to understand each other. It's also the, the time of awakening of the, the prophet or founder and this probably applies to other religions besides Buddhism. This is the most fitting time for examining, investigating, going into, and trying to understand the world in order to find the truth. This is the most appropriate time for trying to understand the world. All re religions, in essence, have the same purpose, the same meaning, and the same activity. But it cannot be helped that they will have different names. But in essence, all religions are basically the same thing. The different religions arise and appear in different times, different eras, as well as different places. And so each religion will have a teaching and that responds to the culture and needs of each particular time and place. So the symbols and language of each religion inevitably will differ from those of other religions. And we're not going to get stuck on the different names, whether the names of the great founding teachers or the names of the religions. We're not going to attach to these names. We're going to focus on the activity which is the same in both religions, the desire to help the world, the work of helping the world. Even if the methods and means of helping the world differ according to the different times, eras, places, and cultures, the and the names, and although the names differ, the languages differ, the heart of all religions is the same. The need, the requirement to help the world. If it, if it doesn't have this aim to help the world, then you can't call it religion. It's not religion at all. Now, we will examine 
certain ways that we can unite and cooperate to help the world. The first thing to take note of is the fact that the world is going to ruin because of progress. It's rather funny that the cause of the world's destruction is being brought about by so-called progress. The world is progressing materially. There is great material progress. And then inwardly, mentally, there is great progress in selfishness, in egoism. There's the outward material development, and in human beings, this tremendous growth of, of selfishness. Economic development increases selfishness. Industrial development increases selfishness. All the different kinds of development in progress are, are paths leading to greater and greater selfishness. The word progress, especially in its Latin roots, can mean crazy or insane. So if we're not careful, the progress that we're engaged in can be nothing but insanity. Something quite frightening is that selfishness is increasing everywhere. Due to progress, the workers are becoming more selfish. The employers are becoming more selfish. The urbanites are becoming more selfish. The, the rural people are becoming more selfish. In short, we can say that all the people are becoming more selfish, are growing in selfishness. Selfish people elect selfish representatives and members of parliament. <clears throat> and so, the, so we end up with parliaments, with congresses, which are selfish. And when these selfish governing bodies are elected, then they set up governments the governing parties and the governments which are selfish. When this is the case, what then will be left that can be unselfish? Where will we find any unselfishness in such a situation? The one who is selfish aims solely for his or her own benefit. And so then they're unable to listen to others. They can't really hear the needs and the, the feelings of others. And so this leads to dissension, to dispute, to argument. With all this disagreement and dispute, then we need to set up an opposition. So in all con most countries there is an opposition which gives an opportunity for selfish people. We'd like to take a little time to examine the, the danger and harm of the first selfish person to see how great or little the danger is of selfishness. The selfish person is, uh, is lazy. They're too lazy to do their work and their responsibilities. And therefore, they're taking advantage of others and society. They're, they're full of envy and jealousy. The selfish person doesn't carry out his duties, yet he, he claims rights beyond what is 
what is fitting. He claims more rights than he actually deserves. The world is filling up with pollution because of selfish people. The destruction of nature, whether the earth, the plants, the forests, or animals, this is done exclusively by selfish people. Traffic accidents, both on the streets and highways, but even in the air, these are the results of selfish people. Sexual crimes are doubling and tripling because of selfish people. Both very dangerous and harmful diseases, as well as drug addiction, are increasing and doubling because of selfish, selfishness in people. Each country is afraid that it will lose some political advantage because they're so concerned or worried about losing political advantages. They don't bother to think in any genuine way about peace. None of these countries really care about peace because all they care about is not losing any political advantages. There isn't one country in the world that is truly interested in world peace. Each of them are solely interested with their own progress and material development. So these days, we're all much more interested in economic matters, politics, the ending of the Cold War, and all these kind of things, far more than we are interested in world peace. All these different kinds of, of wickedness, of loneliness, are the results of selfishness. All of this can probably only be corrected through the through religious ideals or through the return of religion. World peace will remain impossible and out of reach until there is genuine cooperation amongst religions. Next, <clears throat> we'd like to look at some of the problems that exist because of our inability to cooperate. The first item is that when different religions come together, they are unable to smile together. The different religions don't know how to smile at each other or with each other. In some cases, a religion is the selfish party itself. Sometimes a religion thinks only of its own progress, its own development, and then forgets about world peace. And it is obvious that religion, the religions have not yet performed their, their duty completely. Fully. Sometimes religion even serves political ends, allows itself, religion allows itself to serve politics. Sometimes it gets lost in material development, gets religions become infatuated with material progress, and thus there is more concern, more interest in the development of that particular religion rather than the development of peace, the discovery of world peace. This, this points out that the world has yet to receive any proper help from the thing we call religion. 
the religions have not yet helped the world in the way they're meant to do. The religions have not yet performed their duty of eliminating selfishness from the world due simply to the fact that the religions are more interested, more concerned with their own progress and advancement. As long as religions care only about the advancement of the particular religion, then this is selfish and world peace will remain unattainable. Please allow us some time to examine this, this item, this subject particularly. It is a fact that religion appeared in this world for the sole purpose of removing selfishness within this world. If there was not selfishness in the world, if there had not been selfishness in the world, religion never would have had an opportunity to appear. Religion appeared in this world because the selfishness of people in this world forced, forced, compelled religion to appear. Let me stress that if it wasn't for selfishness, it wouldn't have been necessary or even possible for religion to occur. The, what made religion necessary was selfishness, human selfishness. If we go back and examine early history or even prehistory, we'll be able to see that all forms of religion, all religions, even the very early ones, even Judaism, the oldest of the great religions, that even this was a result of selfishness, that back long ago people saw it was necessary to, to gather, to work together, to overcome selfishness. And so there arose religion. When the world is full of selfishness, nature will, will, nature will automatically force a prophet or a great religious teacher to appear. But this, this is a response of nature to the situation in the world. But we can also express it in the very <clears throat> beautiful and poetic terms that God sent the prophet into the world. The, the highest supreme law of nature, which has the same meaning as God, forced or compelled there to be a prophet, the great religious teacher, in order to deal with the selfishness in the world. In groups of people who believe that there is a self or soul or something, then they are taught to surrender this self, this soul, to God. God. This will eliminate selfishness. Buddhism, however, teaches that there is no self. There is nothing, the thing we call a self is not really a self, that no, self, no true self or soul can be found. But this too can eliminate selfishness. Although the causes and origins may differ, the result is the same. The result that selfishness is eliminated, so that there is, that selfishness is removed from humanity 
in order that there can be world peace. There's no need for us to argue about this, this point. Just let there be, just let each of us understand what it is to be unselfish, teach, to teach unselfishness, to live in practice this teaching of unself, unselfishness, so that in this world this can actually be put into practice in order that there will be peace. The word sasana or religion means the survival or the salvation of humanity. The meaning of religion is the survival or salvation of humanity. When we learn religion, we learn unselfishness. When we practice religion, we practice unselfishness. And when we receive the fruits or gifts of religion, then we receive the reality of unselfishness. This is the Pariyati, Bhatibhati, and Bhatiwaita aspects of religion. All of them have unselfishness at their core. The selfish person cannot enter the kingdom of God. The selfish person cannot realize Nibbana. In short, the selfish person cannot, cannot find or reach the goal of his or her respective religion. Every religion in the world must, must hold to the basic principle that its duty is to eliminate selfishness. Each religion has the basic duty of eliminating selfishness. This, replies, this applies to all religions in this world. The destruction of selfishness is the heart of religion. If selfishness is not destroyed, it's the same as if there is no religion. Therefore, the most important thing in religion is the one who helps us to be saved, the one who helps save us or helps us survive, which means the one who helps us to be free of selfishness. Whether we talk of all the great religious founders, as well as the God or gods who are spoken of in personal terms, all of these are the, the ones who help us to get free of selfishness, the ones who save us from selfishness. The supreme thing of Buddhism is not spoken of in personal terms. Nonetheless, the supreme thing of Buddhism or Nibbana, Nibbana is the highest thing, the highest Dhamma in Buddhism. Nonetheless, this highest thing is the same as the elimination of selfishness. When there is total freedom from selfishness, this is considered the highest thing in Buddhism. Whether the supreme thing of each religion is personal or non-personal is not an important question. This isn't a question that's going to make the big difference. The question, however, which is truly important, vitally important, is whether or not this supreme thing, whether personal or non-personal, 
whether or not it can eliminate selfishness. This is the question that matters. Can the supreme thing of each religion, no matter how is it, it is expressed, does it truly get rid of selfishness? So let's not have any disputes about whether the supreme thing is personal or impersonal. Let's just make certain that this supreme thing can eliminate, can destroy selfishness. If we take this bit of disagreement as important, it will be impossible for us to cooperate. The personal God destroys selfishness. The impersonal God destroys selfishness. These, and then the fruit of that is a peaceful world, is world peace. This is what can happen when we don't argue and give up our competition and all that. So may we all work to understand each other's religions. May we, this, <clears throat> may we all meet and get together in order to understand each other's religion. And by this we include all the religions in the world. We must be open to each other in order to understand each other so that there can be peace in the world in order to eliminate selfishness so that there will be peace in the world. The person who has eliminated selfishness within herself or himself will realize the supreme goal of her or his religion. This is something certain and absolute. The, the reasons for it are obvious within it. Those who believe in God can go to be with God. Those who believe in the Paramatman can go to live in or with the Paramatman. Those who believe in Nibbana can go to live in Nibbana. Each, each can reach the highest thing of each respective religion. This is the important thing. And the goal of each religion will be reached, will be fulfilled only by climbing a ladder. And in all cases, this ladder is the elimination of selfishness and egoism. I would like to, I'd like to submit or propose to my Christian friends that the symbol of the cross is an image of unselfishness. The cross is an image of this of total unselfishness or of the highest activity. The symbol is, the cross is a symbol of the I, the ego, the self, and then the, the cutting, to cut, to sever, to eliminate or destroy the, the ego and all selfishness. So the cross is a symbol of perfect unselfishness. Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ is a, a supreme example of unselfishness. Someone who sacrificed himself totally for the sake of others. In Buddhism, all of life 
the entire universe is seen as a stream of dependent origination. When one investigates and discovers this, realizes this fact of dependent origination, then the, the concept, the belief, and the belief of self is eliminated. And when there is no belief in self, when the mind is freed of the, con the, the concept of self, then selfishness has no way of arising. So by seeing the flow of dependent origination, selfishness is eliminated automatically. All images, uh, excuse me, all concepts of self, all beliefs in self arise from, from foolishness, from blindness. We can say that they arise due to a lack of knowledge and understanding of the things we call the instincts. The instincts are knowledge which is inherent, which is natural. But these instincts are lacking in sufficient understanding. And so the concepts of self arise, the beliefs in self arise, and then all the selfishness that arises from this. So all of this selfishness has its roots in blindness, in ignorance, because in fact the self does not exist. The self is merely a misguided con concept, an illusion. When this fact is realized, the ground is removed from under selfishness. There is no way that selfishness can exist. The instincts develop in a way of in increasing ignorance. The instincts at first develop without proper wisdom and then they grow in, in wrong understanding until there arises the illusion of self, this misunderstanding that there is some permanent individual self. And then this grows further through ignorance into to selfishness. When this concept of self arises, then there is the self who receives, the getter, the receiver, there's the self that gives, the giver, there's the taker, there's the one who acts, the actor. And so once this concept of self arises, all aspects of human life are seen as, as self, as I do this, I do that, I get this, I lose that and so on. And then out of this arises all selfishness. Selfishness is rooted in our illusions of things. When this illusion of self arises, when we are infatuated with the positive or the negative, we experience things in this dualistic terms way. Because of our ignorance, we discriminate things as good and evil. And through this dualistic discrimination, which is something we add to life, it's not really there itself, but because we, through our ignorance, we discriminate good and evil, there arises a sense of the belief in the positive and belief in the negative. And when we are infatuated with the positive, then there appears a positive self. When we're trapped or lost in the negative, there arises a negative self. This positive self is selfish in a positive way. This negative self is selfish in a negative way. But in both cases, it's selfishness arising out of our fundamental illusions. 
about this good and evil, about there being a self. And out of this ignorance, this lack of proper understanding, there arises selfishness, positive and negative forms of selfishness. Every religion teaches that we should not be deluded by positive and negative. This is a fact that we must investigate until we realize it fully. If we have not fully penetrated this truth, then we have not really understood our own religion. Our understanding of, our, of each religion, whatever religion we follow, is complete only when we fully realize that it teaches us not to be deluded by, by positive and negative. This is very clear at the very beginning of the book of Genesis. In the second chapter of Genesis, God warns Adam and Eve, the first pair of human beings, not to eat the fruit of the tree that leads to discriminating good and evil. God very clearly warns humanity not to eat that fruit that leads to the knowledge of, the ability to discriminate good and evil. But this pair didn't listen. They went and ate the fruit. And so they fell into this, this kind of discrimination which led to the delusion of good and evil. This, this was the original sin. The original sin was this, the discrimination of good and evil. And since our first ancestors fell into this sin, all humanity has been discriminating good and evil ever since. In the Taoism of Lao Tzu, there is the teaching to not be deluded by the positive and negative, or as they, they call it, yin and yang not to be deluded by yin and yang. Otherwise, it gives rise to a positive self and a negative self and all the selfishness that arises from that. Hinduism teaches not to get stuck in punya and papa. Punya and papa is good and evil or positive and negative once again. They teach if, if you get stuck in good and evil in punya and papa, then you'll never make it to paramatman. One won't enter paramatman. And so, once again, we find the teaching of not being deluded by positive and negative. And in Buddhism, we are taught not to be deluded by Kusala, the wholesome, and Akusala, the unwholesome, which is the same as good and evil. That both good and evil, both the Kusala and the Akusala, are a flow of dependent origination. They're just this flow of dependent origination. If one doesn't see this and attaches to the wholesome and the unwholesome, then there arises the positive self and the negative self. But And then dukkha. Dukkha or suffering, mental conflict, arises through this attaching to things which are in fact just a flow of dependent origination. Nibbana is beyond the influence of duality. Nibbana is beyond or above all the influence uh, and effects of dualisms and dualistic pairs. 
if we are still trapped in duality, if we are still deluded by positive and negative, good and evil, or any of the other dualistic pairs, then one will not realize, one does not experience Nibbana. Notice that we haven't used the word balance or between, but we speak of being above and beyond good and evil, positive and negative. If we're just between good and evil or having a balance between positive and negative, then it's still on the same level, and that's not freedom. It, nibbana, or life, must be above, beyond all the dualities. All of our friends in this world are more and more deluded by positive and negative. People are more caught up in and infatuated in this. This delusion and infatuation with positive and negative is an addiction. It's an addiction far more than any addictive drug. To be addicted to the positive and negative is far worse the material addictions, the physical addictions, are not anything, are really not that much, especially for most people. But this spiritual addiction, this spiritual addiction to positive and negative, this is far worse and causes much greater destruction in, in this world. Therefore, to help our fellow humanity escape or get free of this positive and negative means to help them means to help them get free of the power to escape the power and influence of positive and negative. Modern education supports and promotes the delusion of positive and negative. The reason for this is because religion has been removed from education. Religion makes us more intelligent, makes us wiser, so that we see through the illusion of positive and negative. But education which is non-religious, which is lacking true spirituality, leads to greater, promotes greater infatuation and delusion with the positive and the negative. So now we have this education that sends us, can take us to the moon. But being able to go to the moon hasn't done a thing for world peace. The ability that's gone into going to the moon hasn't been used or transferred in any way to developing world peace. We use this, this material cleverness. We use this technological prowess to satisfy our own desires, to get what we want, to, to give us pleasure. And so it, it's accomplishing nothing in terms of freeing humanity, freeing the world from selfishness. In other areas, there's the, all the great economic progress and industrial development. And now even the post-industrial development. All of these are leading in the same old direction. They increase, they promote people's susceptibility to the delusions of positive and negative. Modern industry, technology, all of these things encourage us to be trapped in the positive and the negative. And so this promotes a more and more selfish world. The spread of this modern economy, modern industry, and modern technology is very effectively promoting greater great and greater selfishness. So the result of greater and greater delusion with positive and negativeness. And from that results increasing 
selfishness in almost all areas of human life and in all corners of the world now that this so-called progress in civilization is becoming ubiquitous. We ought to be able to help our brothers and sisters around the world to get free of this terrible power of positive and negative by relying upon the, the, the power or the, I'm going to say, magic of the thing we call religion, especially each of our particular religions, which we'll examine next. We must each, we must all have some form of meditation or, or prayer, if you will, which is capable of getting us out of, freeing us from the positive and negative. There must be some truly religious form of meditation within each religion that will enable us, enable human beings to get out of the power, get free from the power of positive and negative. Now, this, however, is a rather extensive subject, and so we'll save its discussion for a later time. At this point, we'd like to thank you all for, for listening. We we would like to wish you all, wish us all success in our, in what we're doing here in order to free ourselves from the power of the positive and the negative, in order to realize true unselfishness for the sake of each of us individually, as well as for the sake of world peace. Thank you. And that's the conclusion of today's talk. Oh.